Hello, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to tell you something about um, uh, several things, and give some background before I tell you about Open Source Program Office. Some background that maybe you know and maybe some that you don't. So I'll start with um, telling you something about um, the scope and purpose of an operational arm of WHO. Um, then tell you something about what probably everybody here in the audience knows about. So this is how uh, the traditional disease surveillance works. So, we, of course, we'll use COVID example. And we'll identify some challenges and gaps in that. And then I'll tell you more about uh, how we go about addressing these challenges and gaps and what is the strategic plan, a new strategic plan of WHO to address uh, gaps in the public health and health in general. And then instead of going into something that is closer to my heart because I'm an architect, I won't go into the technical side of it. I'll mention a few technical bits and pieces, but I'll stick with open source program office and how open innovations and open source as a technology side of it um, uh, addresses important points that we need to address. So let's start. Um, you maybe know and maybe, maybe you haven't uh, seen this this way, but actually the, the operational arm of World Health Organization, which is Health Emergency Program, actually um, has a mandate to strengthen global health security. That's in one sentence. What does that mean? That actually means that um, uh, we are conducting uh, and, and performing ongoing global surveillance of public health threats and hazards, including early detection, verification, assessment of risks to provide actionable intelligence for decision making. So this is, this is the scope. And that's decision making throughout emergency life cycle or health emergency life cycle from, well, I say it prediction in, in brackets, we're not there yet, but prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. So I, I guess you're familiar with these graphs and with this kind of um, um, simple statistics, which is just counting. So um, we had this all over the news. When we talk about COVID, we usually talk about this information. Um, this is the early days, still March. So the measures that we know now uh, were not in place and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And we had the two states which are, have interesting, uh, interestingly difficult, dif different information of this kind, South Korea and Italy. It usually starts at the same time in both, both countries. And you can see the difference here in, in um, COVID cases counts. Uh, so the blue South Korea uh, has significantly less counts after a couple of weeks in an outbreak where you had explosion in, in Italy. And it was all over the news. Um, the same with deaths, actually. Not too many deaths in South Korea, uh, but then count of deaths in Italy, skyrocketing exponential growth. But this is naive counting. Naive meaning that, I mean, and you can guess, there's obvious many biases here. First, can we, can we have any, um, derive any inf useful information only from, from this? Uh, probably not, because actually we don't know. Uh, the, maybe, maybe these differences are because uh, of difference in counting. Maybe it's different because South Korea already had in place measures because uh, after outbreak of MERS, which is another coronavirus back in 2015. Um, maybe it's a different virus. So this is where we are a couple of months after, after the outbreak, if we use only this information. And you saw only this information and people communicating only about this information all over the place. That's is even more interesting. Like um, if, if you look at um, uh, the rates, South Korea would be 0.8%, which is around four to eight, it depends on the type of flu, four to eight higher than the ordinary flu, where Italy is 6.2, which is 60 times higher. So, so then if you take this information, extrapolate this to I don't know, United States population, you would have 15 million deaths in the United States if this rate 6.2 is true. We now know after the fact that luckily it isn't that true. So, so what, what is it? So what you normally public health intelligence analysts or public health detectives, as I like to call them, do is they then drill down in more counting. So if you stratify this, the same information uh, by age, I think to me, this is even more interesting now. Now you see in South Korea that the most prevalent or, or the biggest incidence is young people between 20 and 29 not elderly people. In Italy, it's the opposite. 
So now you ask, now if you're an analyst, you need to figure out why. Uh, and, and now we know why. Um, the, here in this part of the world, at the beginning, only people after 50 or people who have some uh, comorbidities or people who have symptoms were tested. The others have not been tested. Where in South Korea, they had tests and they had something else as well, which is actually more difficult to figure out um, and definitely not possible to figure out on time. And that is, um, after MERS, their South Korean government uh, basically allowed uh, mobile network operators to share um, mobility information um, of their users, and also credit card operators as well. And, and even private companies could build APIs or, or apps for this kind of contract tracing. So they had information about young people, they sent them SMSs suggesting to be tested, uh, they knew that they are gathering, of course, uh, in the clubs, you know, restaurants, they're, they're having their life. Um, but you don't know that on time. So how can we react? Uh, how, what can we do? Can we do something proactively? No, we need to wait to see what happens and then all continue having these graphs. So these are challenges. Um, the, if, you, if you ask why don't we have it and what's, what's, do we have some approach? Yes, we do. Uh, and we call it public health intelligence. And public health intelligence is really trying to, um, the, the main objective is to detect um, occurrences that might lead to a disease or any other health threat as early as possible. And this is not possible, unfortunately, from the, public, from, from, from the formal, from formal sources, like through public health institutes or even from hospitals. Um, so what, what we do is actually we use publicly available sources, informal sources, like you know, from the web, uh, web media, other type of media, news, blogs, social networks. Uh, and the idea is really to, to try to detect early, to, to verify, to be able to provide actual intelligence faster and save lives ultimately and, and economies. Um, and we also know that uh, the world is changing. And, uh, the massive urbanization, uh, people are connected uh, even virtually and changing each other's behavior. So really, it's, it's, the pace of change is, is, is really high. And for example, take massive urbanization. I mean, we're reaching uh, the nature where we haven't been before. And we're getting in touch with animals, with plants, with different pathogens and microorganisms that we haven't been in touch before. So um, we need to take into account something that we call One Health, which is connection and interaction between animal, human, and environment health. And this is also not enough. Then we need to take care of any hazard. You know, if there is a mass, mass gathering, if there is a conflict, like a war, you know, you don't have a health care. So that can lead to, to health threat. If you have no, no disasters, man-made disasters or, or natural disasters, the same. So it's a quite comprehensive scope, but we have no other, no other way than to try to tackle this. So. If, if this seems like um, this is a new thing and it seems like um, something that, uh, that should use, uh, that, that is innovative and that, that would use, for example, technology, information communication technology in innovative ways, it's true, but it's not a new discipline. Um, I won't go into details for the sake of time, but uh, even before this 1881, before uh, second part of 19th century, there was a uh, British uh, epidemiologist, John Snow, who actually is very famous for mapping uh, cholera cases in, in uh, Soho district of London, and he managed to find a correlation between water pumps and the cholera cases. So this is what we're trying to do. Really, context is important. You know, if you sneeze now, you would think COVID immediately. You all wear masks and maybe you don't have COVID, but the context is what makes us understand things in one way or the other. Again, the League of Nations had approach, and at the end, uh, World Health Organization, which is founded three years after UN replaced League of Nations. So, you know, people were going about um, uh, addressing uh, the problem of, of and the complexity of un understanding the mechanism of disease spread and, and trying to mitigate, it, at least if not prevent. So, our ambition is big. Uh, we, the only way to go about this in an efficient way is to actually create, because we don't have it, 
a global network of data information insights and knowledge and linked data insights and knowledge from diverse information systems and data sets that we all know are built using different technologies. We have a myriad of systems there and developing. It will always remain the same, different technologies uh, and people using different terminologies. I mean, if you look at one molecule name, you can have 300 names to run the same molecule and things like that. So um, what is the solution? Can we harmonize terminologies and, you know, agree to use one technology? I think we don't need to discuss that. It's impossible. All the people are still trying to harmonize, which is interesting. Uh, talking about uh, harmonized data models, standard data models and things like that, but we know it doesn't work. Um, so our approach is to let people use uh, their terminologies, actually apply, if you want, uh, domain agnostic standard web technologies and apply World Wide Web principle, uh, open world assumption. Anyone can say AAA principle. Anyone can say anything about any topic. So please use your systems, build your systems. But if you can please develop this virtualization linked data layer, uh, put your eyes to your data types and let's make web of data finally, as we have started planning 20 years ago, but we never did it. I mean, Google's and other social networks are having great success with that, but this is not open, it's closed. Um, we, we decided to go that way, knowing that this is probably mission impossible, it's really difficult, but we'll try to use the power of WHO, and the power of WHO lies in that it's an international organization which belongs to every single one of 195 member states, which is practically the whole world. So we're not there yet, and, and um, this is one important part of what we, what we need to do. But what we're doing, uh, we're trying to do something. So, yes, we do have some systems and some communities of practice that are trying to, to detect, uh, to find a needle in a haystack and to detect uh, an occurrence from a messy information, uh, unreliable information, facts, uh, opinions, disinformation, misinformation, rumors, conspiracy theories, all over, for example, web media, including social networks. I would say all over media in general. So um, we're using open source intelligence and people who are from the intelligence sector. We, 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 we borrowed uh, the terminology from the intelligence domain and from security domain. So open source intelligence is really trying to um, um, understand what is going on and create some actionable information out of public uh, information from publicly available sources. Uh, the EUS is, uh, and you can later check it if you have interest, there's, there's a web link there uh, with more details. The EUS is Epidemic Intelligence for Open Sources, which is primarily a community of communities of practice. It's an initiative, global initiative, where WHO is just um, uh, coordinating uh, the global community of practice. Uh, and of course they collaborate, uh, One Health, All Hazards, One Health approach. And the technology side of it is is this system that is getting more and more complex. Um, it's basically a web-based cloud application that uh, uh, in general consists of NLP engine and the user portal. User portal is on the right-hand side. It's a news desk. Basically, you can uh, filter news according to your criteria and categories and labels that these news are labeled uh, for. And you can filter them. You can do text search as well for more details. Uh, and NLP engine is, is the one making that possible. So there we have the usual suspects, language detection, rules-based classification, name and recognition, and some not non-usual suspects. For example, news trustworthiness. I mean, um, if, you, if you look at, I'll try to use this one if it works, yeah. If you look at this here, uh, this peak is actually night bef between 30th and 31st December 2019. So the same engine, uh, no change. Uh, we have, um, by this NLP engine, uh, we have tenfold increase of news articles and other text items that are potentially relevant. Actually, it's mostly uh, from uh, China, Wuhan province, about five cases on unusual, unexpected uh, hospitalization uh, cases that are hospitalized with un unusual respiratory syndromes, uh, symptoms uh, tested negatively for SARS virus. The rest you know, I don't need to tell you. Um, so the, the, this, this uh, platform actually is uh, tapping into more than 13,000 web sources in 
30,000 uh, new, news feeds, um, 80 different languages covering. We have now more than 100 million text items. Um, this is just Twitter accounts, so predefined Twitter accounts. We don't have social, social media processing yet. So this is what we do. Uh, this is what we can do uh, with more or less success. But then, you know, the, the problem that we have faced with unexpected problem was this. So now the whole system is much less useful, if useful at all. We have so many different news articles that need, you need to go through to try to find a needle in the haystack. So is this a noise? And, and we knew that we have a problem with trustworthiness, with misinformation, disinformation, and whatnot. So, so I'm giving you this an example of um, the need for open innovations and open source right now. Um, so this is how we went about this problem. So we decided early, early on, no fact checkers. Um, if there's somebody knowing more about fact checkers and news, you will know why. They're actually not fact checkers. They're biased as well. Uh, and it's known for decades. Uh, so, but that was not the main reason. Also, the other reason was everybody's doing fact checking, so we can as might well try something different. So we're thinking some, some, some of us who have some life experience reading news, and we can't check facts when you read news, don't, you don't have time. Um, you know, I, I know that I'm better and better reading between lines, and I'm much better than, than when I was 25. So the hypothesis is that maybe we can have an algorithm that can learn um, and can predict uh, trustworthiness, so binary classify trustworthy or not, from the writing style and tone. So the hypothesis is that in any given language, say in English, um, people are using the same writing style and tone when they want to, I mean, uh, when they want to, to write something that's trustworthy or the, when they want to deceive you. And then if they want to deceive you, we are also concerned about the intent. And then we have a mess of classes like political and junk science and misinformation, which is non-deliberate misleading and disinformation and whatnot. And they're overlapping if you think about it. So, so basically, uh, I'll come back to the challenges in a second. So basically, we, the experiment was simply to reuse Google BERT transformer-based uh, model. So we basically selected five layers. It's five layer feed forward neural network for those who, who know something about it. And of course, um, it's, uh, uh, we applied transfer learning. We had some pre-labeled news uh, uh, op open there in some GitHub repositories. And we also uh, tried with crowdsourcing and failed <laughs> because actually we were not able to pre-label big enough for BERT for this transformer for our use case. Our pre-labeled training data set was not good enough. And, and we don't know, even if it was good enough, you know, taxonomy of this terminology doesn't exist. If you, if you, if you check Webster or, or Oxford Dictionary, it's really difficult to, I mean, these terms are not there. I mean, we first called it credibility because I, my, my English is not first language. Then we called it reliability. I think trustworthiness is the right term, but, you know, so, so even terminology. So without terminology, without semantics, uh, we can't go far. We can, you know, experiment, and they're all experiments, but it's shoot in the dark. So, so what do we do in, in WHO? We are not IT company. We don't have a million of people. Uh, and we also checked this idea, uh, and we discussed this. We have our collaborators and colleagues and friends uh, from different places. So we, what we decided very early on, okay, we won't go and try to improve the algorithm. This will be open source uh, because we engage with AWS or Amazon Machine Learning Lab from Oxford. We needed to agree with them on the type of license and then um, the DevOps has to be thought through properly because it has to be open source and community building we already did. Uh, it's really multidisciplinary, live social computer science. It's academia, McGill, Cambridge, Imperial College, London, University, Texas, Austin, I maybe forgot a few, private sector, I mentioned the AWS or Amazon, um, and supranational organizations that try to be exact here. EU is not international, supranational, so we have um, partnership with Joint Research Center. It's, it's more than collaboration, I would say. Um, and um, I will just skip through. I already mentioned we have a number of initiatives uh, in, and we established a term collaborative intelligence and created a new WHO hub for pandemic epidemic intelligence based in Berlin, who is serious about the objectives that I told you. Um, and one piece of the puzzle is open source program office. Um, 
before I just go into quick details, and I'm now over time, so I hope I can spend a few minutes. Um, our reality check when you start engaging in these projects that I mentioned is that uh, we have a problem, we have a challenge with multidisciplinary collaboration. I mean, it's, it's romantic to say different disciplines sit together and then work together, but uh, the reality is different. You know, when you put engineers like me and doctors like my colleagues who are epidemiologists together, you don't know whose ego is, is bigger, so there is a challenge there. Um, and then private to public sector, we are having collaboration. We that's why Open Source Program Office, among other things. Uh, it was inspired by our attempts to, to work with colleagues who have exper uh, expertise, but then, you know, we had a challenge to find a sweet spot between global goods, so that you cannot own, but you need to be profitable, of course, if you're private sector, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So how do we go about this is a challenge. Competence, uh, learning new skills uh, requires substantial investment of time. That's why I mentioned that project. You can imagine, I mean, it's, it requires real machine learning. You can't just use Scikit or some, uh, or some library and then button click and, you know, off you go. You need really to think about the model and try to experiment and do real, real modeling there. So, you know, it's not easy to find these people. Um, steep learning curve, of course, when you engage people. And if you go into uh, knowledge modeling and semantic web, it's even steeper now. Um, so there is a deficit of, of people there. And it's also an epidemiological level. I mean, these concepts are completely new for epidemiologists. I mean, they, they used to use R and this um, exploratory statistics, so maybe some inferential statistics, some linear regression type. Um, and that's all, that's, they stop there. So now introducing these concepts to them, including using you know, network analysis and graph theories in, in the analytic workflows is, is really difficult to, to discuss with them and to propose. So there is, there, is a, there is a problem. How do we address this problem? One piece of the puzzle, engage everyone, citizens, communities, anyone who is interested. This is a global good, this is health, it concerns all of us. And uh, in, in, uh, we did the homework before we, we got the green light to establish this organization and the homework, um, uh, the result was this. Um, the open source program office should be a benevolent leader. It should provide advisory role to any project who is actually leading and, and they know what they want to do. So they, if they need legal advice, of course, licenses come to mind, procurement, technical, capacity building, community building, they should provide advice, maybe write some policies and guidelines and simply be that competence center that can help uh, individual projects to accelerate or make a right decision. Um, and I'll skip this, this one, but you know, there is, there is a capability maturity model there and we had internal uh, embracement of inner source, um, which is open source within boundaries of WHO. So sharing between WHO teams, that was not possible before. Um, and this was embraced by Chief Technology Office, uh, but community building capacity management maturity that is required for real open source, they said, no, no guys, we don't know how to work with people outside. Nobody worked with outside in WHO before. Um, and yes, that was a problem. We needed to go rogue because we didn't have a platform to share our code, that algorithm, for example. We had SVN, so, 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 so how can we do it? GitHub came proposing to work with us and offers us uh, pro bono um, uh, help when COVID started. We embraced this. GitHub is now, and this is uh, GitHub World Health Organization organization. You can check it there. You can see a mess right now. You can see 70 odd, I think, public repositories. Uh, I think none has any license uh, information there. It should happen soon because we're establishing open source program office, but um, yeah, this is our platform. And I'll end with this, in the spirit of open source. So it's an open question. It's really multi intelligence is, and public health intelligence, therefore, or health intelligence, if you go down to individuals, diagnostics, i.e. diagnostics, is it requires multidisciplinary knowledge. So anybody is invited. And we are really serious about creating this collaborative environment. We have organization already. It's politically supported. It's in Berlin. You know, all this is currently pretty strong from these you know, um, political points of view uh, and pretty much at the beginning from the technical point of view. So open, open invitation if you want to collaborate with us. I mentioned um, profile is a listed few here. 
Um, but also, if you want to join with us into the, in this, in this uh, paradigm shift and creating semantic web, so if you want to put linked data API on top of your software that you build to enable to, to expose or put data on the web, um, give us a shout, because you might have some contextual information that might lead us to early detection or early understanding on, on some of some uh, disease pattern. Um, I'll end with this, and here's some details if you want to contact me, and I can bring, put you in touch with others, and thank you very much for your patience.